Well, I've met and interviewed some really interesting people over the years who aren't famous and who don't have millions of fans on social media, but who are totally unique, overachievers, academics, and I actually really believe to be game changers. Uh, and I think today we're meeting one of those people. I'm introducing you to Dr. Nemanja Baladic. Did I say it kind of almost right? You did, but I'm okay. still not sure you're talking about me here. I am, actually. A Serbian who had an outstanding varsity basketball career playing for the Ottawa UGGs uh, has an incredibly interesting, realistic, holistic approach to medicine and to surgeries. His company, Oneness Medicine, focus on, focuses on the evolution of consciousness-based medicine. I'm really excited for this. He's got Harvard on his resume, Dr. Andrew Wheel as his mentor, his name on award-winning medical papers and research. I do think we're going to have plenty to talk about on today's episode of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. The episode brought to you by Extension Marketing, and for more information, as always, you can head to extensionmarketing.com. Hi. Hello. I'm excited for this. I am. Leanne, can, can you call me on days where I'm feeling down? Just remind me of all that stuff periodically. Uh, I will remind you of it because, <laughs> you know, in doing the research and in looking through all of your stuff, it's like, oh my goodness, like, where do you go from this? And I think like the over, not like the overachiever aspect, but there is like an overachiever aspect. And, you know, for people who are going to be sitting there, some people are looking at this, some people will maybe hear it, but you're young too. You've kind of accomplished all this and have done so at a very young age. Well, uh, overachieving takes one to no one, first of all. Thanks. Um, and yes, it's just a massive overcompensation for childhood insecurities, but no. It really is. I don't think so. I should also mention you're like 6'9". There's like nothing insecure about anything. You walk into a room and the room kind of stops. Uh, I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you so much. And it's interesting because I was trying to picture the days of maybe when I would have covered you or talked to you about kind of the basketball side of your life, right? right? right, Uh, And you were playing for the Ottawa UGGs when basketball, there was this fantastic rivalry between the GGs and the Ravens. It's kind of when you guys stepped up and kind of put a halt on the Ravens' domination for a little while. Yeah, we gave him some. We gave him some resistance. We didn't really, we didn't get that championship, which is something definitely that would have been nice. Yes, but we did start, you know, the the rivalry and and continuing basketball to evolve in Canada, which I think was huge. It was. I think it was so great to be able to have that rivalry created because there was such domination for the Ravens basketball for so long. I I don't like to think about that, Leanne. That's one of the things I try to block out of my mind. It's pure (laughs) domination. Let's be realistic. Okay, so Serbian. Um, yes, from like, the Balkans, uh, okay. born originally in Sarajevo in the former Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. uh, Serbian background, Montenegro, but I regard myself like I'm from the Balkans. You're from the Balkans. When did life switch? When did you, when did the family or all of you kind of come across? Uh, it switched when the fireworks started in uh, 1992. Uh, the Is that Bal- how you refer to them, the fireworks? That's what we say. Okay. Um, so yeah, 1992, the, uh, the Balkan War. Uh, essentially, uh, my family and I had to leave uh, Bosnia, as many other families did. Um, and we went to Serbia, to Belgrade, until we got my dad out of the war. And then after that, we were applying for uh, refugee status all over the world. And uh, Canada was a place where my parents thought, you know, it would be a great fit for us to start a new life. And just like many other families, you know, from all over the world to find solace in Canada. And we came here and started a new life. And here we are. 1992. Can I ask how old old you were at this time? So the war started in 1992. We were in Belgrade to 95. So I got here when I was 95, uh, which is, I was nine. You were nine. Yeah. But there was a a clear understanding, I would assume. You got here at nine, but your whole childhood had been plagued by war and, you know, no safety net. Like there was an unknown through most of your childhood. Um, yes and no, because in Sarajevo, I, I was six years old, and we, we got out fairly early. We got mm-hmm. really lucky, and we moved to Belgrade where there was there was no direct war. Most of it was around Sarajevo and, and, and parts of the uh, borders of Croatia. Um, so there was a lot of inflation, and there wasn't uh, many resources, but we did not deal with direct war. And that's why I actually had an amazing childhood when I was in Belgrade, and we were outside all the time. And that's where a lot of the athletic stuff comes from, mm-hmm. is because now kids are not outside. And we, we, all we did was be outside. We're like, okay, cool. Somebody bought a basketball. We're playing basketball this week. Then we ruin the basketball. Then we get a soccer ball for the community. And I think in that for way. For the community. Yeah. Well, for the community. It wasn't like the kid, every, every kid next door has got a ball. No, it's, no it's, it's the community. It was like, man, we just popped our only soccer ball and we don't know when we're going to get another one. But it was awesome in that sense. We were constantly outside. It develops your social skills. It develops your general athleticism. Um, so then coming to Canada was an awesome experience as well. So, It's funny that you say that because 
I grew up in a, in the generation too, right, where we left the house and we were at the park and right. our, our parents said, come back when the, when the street lights go on, right? And we would be exploring the parks and, you know, the woods and right. making tree forts. And, and I, I miss that. I wish so much that, that our children of this these generations are able to do that. It just just isn't happening. But we'll get to that on the yeah, yes, side of things. Yeah, yes, that's a big topic, yeah. Because I, because I know it's something, I think we'd both be passionate about it, right? For it's sure. Just get every, kids outside and moving and not having to have everything supervised. I, I'm an aspiring moment. mother myself. I would love to discuss really? this. Really? Okay, okay. <laughs> We're going to get to that. I, I don't even want to go into what it's like to be like uh, with you as a dad. Okay, so you you come to Canada. Mm-hmm. Did you set, was Ottawa where you first arrived to? Like, or was there a mixture? Yeah, we first got to Ottawa. Um, we received where a lot of other immigrant families are received at the reception house. And mm-hmm. my parents had to spend, you know, the first 10, 15 days looking for apartments. Um, and I was with my cousins actually who came a couple of months before us, which was nice. Um, essentially, they did all the work. And once all that was done, they're like, okay, son, come back to the house. We're ready to start. Uh, the first apartment was at Lee's Avenue, like 180 Lee's, like yeah. where a lot of the student housing is now. And that's where I grew up near that park and near this whole area. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of my educations happened literally in a span of like three blocks. I went to Viking Alexander for uh, my first primary school. Then I went to Immaculata. Then I went to Ottawa U. And they shipped me off to a Caribbean island for med school. I don't know about that. So. Where is, was English first language? What, when did English become part? Like, what were you speaking? It was Serbian? So the language of the Balkans is technically called Serbo-Croatian. So that's, okay. that's the language I was speaking. How hard was it to learn English? At nine? Um, yeah, there's a couple of instances when I first got to my first day in school where you want something and, and you just can't communicate it. But you're kids, right? Like your brain's a sponge. So I, I think I was fluent in three months. You were fluent in three months yeah. as a nine-year-old. Come, that that's impressive. I think that just shows just the brain, your the way your brain functions, because it's at such a high, higher level than most. So they say. I, I'm really <laughs> that. Your height? Were you always? I mean, were you like you? You have a, a a grand stature. Were you tall early on? Did you have a growth spurt, or or really when you got here, there was this athletic powers to you too that you knew you'd be a great athlete. Well, if you see if you see the Balkans, for example, there's actually interesting research just came out. Uh, people from the Netherlands, the Balkans, a couple of regions of Africa, they're directly linked to tribes that used to eat mammoth exclusively. So they got the highest quality protein, the highest quality, you know, animal fats, and apparently that's conditioned, you know, and correlated to you know bigger stature and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you look at, for example, the Balkans. <laughs> did you did you look at like Ancestry.com or? I, I didn't. No, it's actually a paper. You can look at it, um, but I should. And if you actually it's look really at people from Croatia and, and, and Bosnia and Serbia mm-hmm. and those regions, the populations are so small. You know what I mean? But the amount of high level athletes they produce is is unbelievable for for the results of you know the mm-hmm. actual population. Oh well, it's amazing. Basketball natural talent for you? I mean, you said you grew up playing basketball and soccer. Like, but what was the the draw to basketball? My parents. My, my mom was actually one of the best three-point shooters in all of Yugoslavia, which, you know, um, she was incredible. She was, she was one of the best people in, in the city. And back then, even, you know, people take sports really seriously in the Balkans. And even she was like a mini celebrity in the city, even, a, you know, as a female basketball mm-hmm. player, which you would think, oh, it's not a big deal. There, it's a big deal. So I got that from her, the competitiveness. Um, my dad's more like a, a sweetheart, creative guy, uh, mm-hmm. but he was also very athletic. Uh, so they taught me everything from a young age and make me fall in love with the game. So the game worked for you. I mean, to be able to play, and then was it a high school was... Mac- which high school? It was yeah. Maculata, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, so you played through high school mm-hmm. basketball. Did you realize that you had a chance? Like, did you consider going and playing somewhere else, or was Ottawa U where you wanted to end up? Ottawa U is where I wanted to end up. <clears throat> but um, I actually, my first year, <clears throat> I didn't actually make the team, interestingly enough. That's, that's a, like a big story for me, is that, you know, I came out of high school as a, as a high school all-star and stuff like that. I was getting recruited by the uh, basketball team, and the big thing for me whether it was to go to Carleton or go to Ottawa but when they found out that I wanted to do uh, more medical related studies you know Carleton was really off the table and then essentially I was gunning for Ottawa U and you know I was getting recruited and the coach came over and blah blah and I went to Serbia to train that summer and I get a call and it's like oh the Ottawa U roster came out and you're not on it and I come back and what happened what's going on like oh I over recruited and it's just like you're gonna have to like sit out this year and earn your spot again 
Well, to me, like, wow. you know, at that time, you, that's your identity, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm a basketball player, right? Like, you're, every kid, like, lives and breathes that. So that was, like, a huge heartbreaking moment for me that actually was huge adversity that led to a lot of things. My friend, I don't know if you know Paul Oneid, uh or not. He's, he's a big, like, weightlifting uh, coach now. He's, like, high-level weightlifting athlete. So me and him, we, we got a personal trainer. We were training every day, like, running, lifting, uh, doing everything. And I'd put on, like, 15, 20 pounds of muscle in three months. And the Ottawa U coach comes to me and he's like, oh, like, you want to come play next year? And I was like, yes, absolutely. This is what I've been trying to do. So from that, you know, the first year I didn't play much. Then by third year, I was starting. We were top five in the country. Then by fourth year, it's like we had beat Carlton for the first time. And at the end, we all did well and did what we needed to do, you know. So you have this determination. I mean, it takes a lot for someone to think that they're going to school to play and not end up on that roster. Right. It's not even like you're not ending up on that starting lineup it, to not even end up on the roster. You kind of figure out how to be able to impress coach. End up having a stellar career. Uh, and at the same time, or at a school where you knew their focus was based on on your academics as well. And I think that's what, you know, especially to the balance of student-athlete life. People re- don't realize. I always say a student-athlete is probably the best person to get to do something because mm-hmm. we, we, like, we know how to time manage uh, and, how and the to worst person to, to argue with. The worst. Why is that? Because <laughs> we're all stubborn. <laughs> Everyone's stubborn and competitive, you know. And let's that just say true. your partners have to be very understanding. That 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 is true. <clears throat> I actually, if I look at it, you're right. When did the passion for medicine set in? So I got into Ottawa U. Actually, there was a basketball player. Uh, his name was Alex Dufour, and and he was six seven. He was a great shooter. He, he was inhuman kinetics, and he was like my inspiration. And then. I, I wanted to get into kinesiology. So what was a way that I could be in biology and sports and have like a, a cool element, social element. So that was kinesiology for me, human kinetics. Um, by fourth year, I met a really amazing professor, uh, Professor Terry Orlick, and also Ms. Uh, sports psychology. That's right. I, uh, I'm a Terry Orlick grad. Like I, oh, yeah? Uh, my athletic career, I think I owe him a ton of my success to Terry Orlick. That's awesome. I didn't yes, know that. yes. So he was it, huge for me. It was Terry and Penny Werdner um, that were you know, the heads of the department at that time uh, who really inspired me with their class. And Terry was talking about quality of living and positive living skills. And for me, what had happened through basketball is that I had like a crazy shooting per- percentage in high school, like ridiculous. People were like, what is happening? He's shooting like 68% a game. And when I came to university, I started like to doubt myself and blah, blah. And like I wasn't playing the way I wanted to in my early years. And then that's what drew me to sports psychology. And I was like, why on some days am I so focused and whatever, so in- into the moment and other days I'm not. And I wanted to know the science of this. And I was fascinated with people and social interactions. And through these studies, it drew me to understanding performance in the moment. And then I got my game back or past a certain, even a level that I was surprised with. So then that's what really got me uh, thinking about I should do a master's with them. Terry was like, oh, we have a master's out of you. And because I got cut that first year, I actually had five years of eligibility, mm-hmm. which would equate to four years of undergrad and two years of master's. So five years of basketball, the first year I didn't play. So then, yeah, I actually got a scholarship for that master's, worked with Professor Terry and continued to develop and played basketball till the end. I just, I didn't know that, that it was a, a sports psychology interest that kind of led down that path. Yeah. So then it was very counseling oriented, right? It's it's health and performance psychology. It's like what we're doing, what you're doing right now is these interventions with people and and, and understanding what motivates them to change their lifestyle. Well, when I finished the program, you know, I was still kind of sitting like, this is awesome, but I I feel like I need more tools to help people for for my purpose. So that's why I was thinking about medicine. And that's why I got pulled into med school because I wanted a complete package to be able to look at a person and say, okay, this is what you need, this, this, this and this. And to, for the, to do that, you're like a mechanic, like you need all sorts of different tools to you know, fix a problem that's presented to you. Okay, so you've done your undergrad, had this basketball career, done this master's program. Where was the decision? At what point is like, what type of medicine then? Or did it, was it just, let's get into the program, let's continue the education and then see where it goes? Because you've landed yourself in a very different spectrum of medicine than I think the sports psychology aspect, although it does play into effect. Yes. Did you apply at different places? How did you decide on med school? So that was another, you know, kind of twist in the story is where 
a lot of, that's the problem in, in Canada, right? We do not have many spots in medicine. It's extremely competitive. In the States is very expensive. So a lot of what a lot of Canadian students are faced with is the reality is that they need to go elsewhere. So there are options on the table where they can go to these uh, American schools that are based in the Caribbean, where they can do their basic science there and then do all their clinical education in the States and then still be able to come back to Canada in the States. Some go off to Australia, some go off to I don't know, Ireland, England, Scotland. Um, so that was it. I saw many people uh, applying to Canada, what was going on and with amazing applications, amazing GPAs. I even went to talk to the Dean of Health Sciences and he knew me from my community work at the basketball. And he's like, I'll write you a letter of reference. You should apply here. And I just was like, I could wait here for a year to potentially get in. To potentially get into Ottawa U. Potentially get into which, Ottawa U. Which yeah. has a fantastic medical program. It does. Right? You Absolutely. Know, it's, it's, it's well known for that. Absolutely. And so I could wait to get in there potentially, or I could start at this school in September 100%. And to me, I was like, wow, I get to study in the Caribbean. I get to travel. I get to do my clinical work in the States and still come back and do residency in whatever in Canada and the States. I was like, sign me up. And it was cheaper. Um, retrospectively, <laughs> I don't know if I would have made that decision, but because it was why, a much Why more, do you say that retrospectively? Um, you know, obviously everything happens for a reason right. and we're, we are exactly where we need to be, but it's just, that was a path of, you know, extreme adversity for, for a lot of us. And, you know, and, and that path is not guaranteed that you're going to get a residency or anything or for that matter. Um, in Canada, it's very difficult to get into school, but once you're in, it's, you know, there's a plenty of residency spots for a lot of people that do considerably well. But I hear at those schools, you can get in, but it's really hard to stay in. And like get out once, even harder. Right. I have heard that, that once you, it's like you're working around the clock to maintain the grades, to maintain the, the knowledge base, to be able to continue on. Right. Well, that's truly where my story really like turn, yeah. turns into what, where, where it's at now, because when I got, I went to a school called Sabre University School of Medicine, which is uh, an American school, again, based in the Caribbean for the first two years, where it's a lot of the, the, the basic science work in the classroom. And then all uh, clinical education is in the States through, you know, major hospitals in the United States. So when I got there, it, w it was a shocker. It was an accelerated program. It was about a year and a half instead of two years for that regular period of time. There was no summers off. Uh, we had exams every three weeks on the same day, eight hours to mimic the United States medical licensing examination, which was literally like the, one of the hardest, if not the hardest exam in the world. So they were conditioning us to perform every three weeks. And the best way I could describe it is, is imagine you're in exams for two years straight, like that level of intensity. So every year, every day you get like a hundred slides per class. So you got to go do that because next day the, there's more coming. So when I got there, it was a shocker and I didn't have this crazy biochemistry background like a lot of students. So initially I had to rely on my performance psychology, believe it or not. And and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna outwork everybody. I'm gonna show up to lab early, I'm gonna leave late, blah, blah. But it's not a blah, blah, it's, it's what works. It's it, what worked for you. It worked until it didn't work because okay, so that wasn't enough. Are, okay, so into lab early, last one out, study sessions, like. So that's it. And so I was forcing my way through it. I was like, I'm going to work my way through this. And there came a point where it was just was not enough. So then that's when I truly started to look into my methods and what I was doing. So then I was like, okay, this isn't working for me. I need to like learn smarter. So then I had to learn how to isolate information properly, um, what was important, what was testable, and literally learn the science of studying. So I was like, I'm an athlete. Why am I sitting idling at this desk. So then I started taking my notes um, when I came home and I started reading out loud, walking around the room, drawing on the walls and doing visualization, you know, like mm -hmm. sports psych and all that kind of stuff. And that changed everything for me. Like I woke up the next day, I had an exam, like I knew everything, I could visualize it in my mind, it was there. And so literally I had, had to develop my own method uh, the way an athlete would study. And then my, my grades skyrocketed and all my classmates, like after first semester, like what is going on? Like, how did you... How did you make the switch? Yeah, and that's why I'm like so passionate now about, about that whole and, and medical student health and medical student um, learning psychology is because we do have a huge epidemic in, in medicine. So after we all got off that island, you know, like we were all stressed to the gills. Like I came back to Ottawa, I remember like I was a, like a, a mess, right? Like my cortisol was through the roof, I needed to find ways to recharge my body from, you know, all that stress. And interestingly enough, like 60 to 80% of medical students, they take ADHD medications, antidepressants, the doctor suicide rate is through the roof, which is a whole nother topic entirely. Um, 
but for me, what had helped me is like having that performance background. Like I knew the pressures and I knew all this stuff and, but I still needed a way to, to recharge. Were you able to share some of this with your classmates? You know, when they're looking at your first semester to second semester and how you made this leap, like, are you saying to them, I changed the way I, I studied. I changed the way my body and my mind were connecting the same way I was as an athlete, right? My, I was always a better student if I had a good workout and my brain and my, my body were working mm. together, right? Which is what I'm thinking you were doing as you're walking, pacing a room, seeing things visualize. Like yeah. I'm seeing, you're studying that, that medical board like you were game plan like coaches kind of putting showing you yeah, yeah what the what the the court's gonna look like and you're looking at it like the body you never watch like a, a beautiful mind with Russell, Russell Crowe like yes I, I'm picturing yeah. that that's what, your, that's what the wall looked like is that what the yeah. wall looked like that's what yeah. the wall looks like yes. and essentially people would come into my room and it would just be everywhere right on all these papers and it was it was my friends would be like oh my god what is this I'm like it's the address to your house written a thousand times over <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh. yes I would share with them but ultimately everybody had their own methods mm -hmm. and, and the most important thing is that working hard was not enough I absolutely had to evolve and work smart so like an athlete, you have to work hard and you have to work smart. Working hard is not enough, which which eventually got me to that realization. So then I came back to Ottawa looking to recharge and looking at what medicine was, you know, that they were, you know, largely driving people into the ground. People that were meant to be healers mm -hmm. were getting pounded into the ground. And it's happening epi epidemically all over Canada, all over states. So these medical students are coming back broken and... I went to like a acupuncture, uh, it was like a holistic health convention and I met a really cool guy. He actually owns an amazing clinic here, uh, Oak Tree Health, uh, Martin Paris. And uh, I did my acupuncture treatments and my Chinese herbs. And that got me thinking like, you know, with, you know, the holistic psychology background, this performance psychology background of that, I'm like, maybe there's better ways in medicine. Maybe we need to do other things. And then that's where I started. People started attracting themselves to me in a sense, and I, me to them through that kind of like the vibration of wanting something different. Mm -hmm. and I started meeting healers, energy healers, shamans, you know, uh, naturopathic doctors, and I wanted to learn more. All the while, still having the reality of like, hey, I gotta write the USMLE in like four months, like the United States Medical right. Licensing Exams. Yes. So I was studying in Ottawa, you know, like fifteen hour days, sixteen hour days, and that's where a lot of people. I didn't really talk to anybody. Like when I when I left Ottawa, I was like this universal university basketball playing, bartending, modeling dude that got yeah, us. I didn't even like, mention the modeling part in it. Whatever. So I was I was gonna <laughs> skip that until the very end. Yes. Yeah. But like that's what people knew me as, right? And then mm -hmm. I went off to school and, and like everything had changed. Like I had to let all that go and literally spend fifteen hours a day in my room because you know, we had put up two hundred thousand dollars to pay for school. And then that's where really things things changed for me so like i came here i started learning like doing meditation retreats i did a 10-day vipassana meditation retreat where you meditate for 10 hours a day which is completely life-changing really okay i have i think i've spoken a little bit on the podcast i started meditating uh, about yeah. two months ago um and i mean i know that it, i like just like an athlete mentality i know it's going to take some time to be able to train my body and my right. mind to be able to do it properly but i keep thinking that once it clicks like once i'm able to do it properly There'll, there'll be some, you know, like aha moment right. that like my body, my mind feel a different connection. But I can't imagine. I'm really impressed with myself. I'm got. I've up to 20 minutes now. I can't imagine 10 hours. Like, what is a 10 hour meditation per day like? Like, what are you doing? This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally, as I've been using the extension marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Well, it's not an all-in-one shot. Um, but it, how long are you sitting or in this mind space? So it's like a structured uh, approach where like in the morning, you wake up, you do two hours, then you go have breakfast, then you go come back, you do two more hours, and then you have lunch. And it's like a full day schedule, which is... What very, are you thinking about in that two hours that you're doing differently in the next two hours? You're thinking about not thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but essentially, there's a very there's a strong purpose for that. And that Vipassana is the technique of meditation that was taught by the Buddha, but it was... It was just uh, as a technique. It wasn't a religious thing. I mean, you know, Vipassana was taught by him. And then eventually he taught that to five different teachers. Three of them went to India. Two of them went to Burma. In Burma, that technique was preserved in that universal 
format well and when i went to india you know religious practices got added to it and now we have modern buddhism and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff but vipassana in in its in its essence is exactly what mindfulness derives from you know dr john kabat zinn uh dr herbert benson a lot of the pioneers in in this mental health and getting meditation into medicine they took principles from vipassana meditations to create mbsr mindfulness-based stress reduction but this is the same okay technique. i'm sorry say that you said that really fast mindfulness space mindfulness based stress reduction mindfulness based stress reduction that's right okay we like to use a bunch of weird acronyms in medicine well no it, but it, it makes sense but if you actually listen and really hear what those words are saying yeah it's like i want some of that I mean, point is, just like they're, they're, you know, they're now sharing that with the world through techniques and courses and workshops, but it all stems from this practice, this technique. And essentially, because we are now in such a hyper-socialized world with social media and everything like that, for a person to be able to sit down and meditate and have certain realizations that are necessary to understand our nature and how the mind works and how do we can use that to live better lives is extremely difficult. So Vipassana, the first four days, you're doing concentration meditation you know, focusing on the natural breath and when your mind wanders, you bring it back. Only on day five, when you've concentrated your mind and you're able to naturally feel sensations that are arising on your body, you start observing sensations throughout the body. And then you see that every sensation, physical sensation, is actually linked to uh, a state of the subconscious mind. And by having now a physical object of observation, you get to see, experience yourself that whatever arises is impermanent. So it's no longer theory, it's no longer Oh, you should focus on this and you're going to feel more relaxed and whatever. That's great. But the essence of it is what's causing us to be not relaxed is that when we, when the mind has the two the spectrums of the mind, you know, fear and desire, it's like when we have certain, you know, fearful thoughts or whatever, there's a sensation that arises in the body. And then we react to that sensation with more of the same frequency. And then that energy starts to get perpetuated and then it arises at different times. So when we say someone got triggered, what does that mean? That means when there's be spit and creating in their life, whether it's fear, anger, craving, whatever, that energy lies dormant in us. And once something triggers that, that arises, and then that person goes to a visceral experience. So next time with a technique like this, when that happens, you observe the sensation that is linked to that particular emotion or energy or frequency. And by having an object of observation, you're able to let it pass and experience that it's impermanent. And knowledge in impermanence will allow us to not react because you know, oh, this is going to pass whatever it may be it's mm -hmm. going to pass it's going to pass and this it's a cleansing process so that is necessary to do in a 10-day format just because to feel sensations leanne it's like it's like take, giving somebody a, a slide with a with a piece of red blood and you're saying hey this is a bunch of cells and you're like no it's not it's a blotch of red but when i give you the right tool i give you a microscope you're going to look through the microscope and you're going to see oh my god that's actually a bunch of red blood cells same thing with Vipassana. If I told you, well, actually, Leanne, we are vibration, frequency, and energy, and we are oscillating, even though this seems solid, it's not. You're gonna be like, you're crazy. If somebody punches you in the face, you're gonna feel re really real. But in meditation, all these sensations arise, and you experience that a dissolution, and you really see that we are fluidity, we are energy, we are frequency. But the main point is, is you've achieved this through your own practice. You, you didn't have to read a book. You didn't have to do anything. It was through your own work and your own realization. This is some of the own work and some of the own realizations that you were doing in the midst of coming back, being in med school, being kind of that trigger point of like stress beyond belief. Right. And then you get through these two years of doing this. Where do you go then from there? Because you were saying two years is on the island and then you're kind of being placed everywhere else. Right. So yes. are you starting to have a passion for one way of medicine after the two years or where your energy or where your passion is? So... Then after I did all, all this kind of stuff, I started, you know, obviously doing more of those meditation retreats, learning from different people and everything started to change. Like I, like I was changing and, you know, the, the way I was interacting with people, the people that they knew me as the old me was gone. So it was like a, a whole new life. Uh, so I needed to get back to clinical medicine and I, I did. I did some really interesting rotations. Uh, um, I went to Miami for pediatrics. I did internal medicine at Yale, George Washington University for obstetrics. And when I was in Baltimore, I was doing interesting research with a, with a novel antioxidant. I had prepared this whole manual. I'm sorry, say that again? A new antioxidant. A new antioxidant. And yeah. that was in Baltimore. Um, right. So I had prepared this manuscript when I was at, uh, at Internal Medicine in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I came to Baltimore with this full manuscript. And, and essentially, I was told that I shouldn't do it while I'm in med school. But I had, I had it prepared. 
then I was like, okay, you know what? I'm an athlete. I love performance. I lo love working with my hands. Maybe surgery is for me. And then, well, what kind of surgery? I thought that general surgery was a bit too like rough for me. And I love like artistic stuff. I used to draw as a kid and work with my hands and play basketball. Maybe plastics is for me, like where you get to like, reconstruct and, and really work on the aesthetic aspect of things. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm in Baltimore, the city of medicine, Johns Hopkins Hospital mm -hmm. is here. I was doing a, uh, grand rounds at Johns Hopkins. We were very lucky to be able to do that. So I'm like, okay, who's in the you know the plastic surgery department at Johns Hopkins? Look, let me go talk to them. And I look, uh, and it's um, Dr. Branko Bojevic, who's you know one of the uh, the guy that actually pioneered the face transplant. And he's a fascinating. Wow. Yeah, the, well, the first North American face transplant was done by him and his team uh, through Johns Hopkins Hospital. I think right now what I want people to, to realize, I mean, this wasn't about plastic surgery in, in terms of, you know, like boob jobs and facelifts. Yes. So that's right? a huge, like, yeah. Like, I, because you say that, right? You say plastic surgery and I and I feel bad, but oftentimes you kind of go to, you know. Yeah. No, that's actually, housewives I'm glad of, you brought that uh, up. Housewives of Toronto. You know what I mean? Like, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's Toronto now. Toronto's becoming a big city. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Anything can be done with consciousness or unconsciousness, whatever the activity may be, right? So essentially, many people look at plastic surgery and like, oh my God, was, you're right, it's just booze jobs, ass jobs, this kind of stuff. But we do pediatric burns, pediatric reconstruction. Um, if, if something happens, God forbid, it's somebody, most of the time it's an orthopedic surgeon, a plastic surgeon, and a general surgeon working together to piece this person together. And, you know, we can discuss some of the cases, you know, later, but this is what the essence of plastic surgery is, is knowing that these, these people are giving people faces. Like we had done a case where a girl was flown in from Africa and a suitor that she didn't want had snuck into her house and poured acid on her face. And she showed up to Boston like no face, you know, and Dr. Boyevich and, and his team like literally like reconstructed her face and i remember like seeing her in the hallway in the cafeteria and shriners hospital for burn kids is an amazing institution where these kids come from these long form surgeries these long reconstructions and you see the progress like and you know when she like was able to smile again and her eyelid was able to move like this is plastic surgery right and of course there's aesthetic stuff and whatever mm -hmm. that's you know that there's a huge element of psychology there and understanding that we're not the body and all that kind of stuff but there's many things and point being everything can be done with consciousness or unconsciousness. Okay. I took you off of that for a second. Cause you were talking about this paper, like you, you, right. you get to Baltimore and you've got all the stuff you've been working on. Yes. So I, I uh, find my way up there to the department of plastic surgery and you know, I leave my CV for Dr. Boyevich. I'm like, this is what I've done. I have this amazing paper. And he's like, this guy's not going to call me. He's like a world renowned like surgeon. He's not going to get, give me a call. I'm leaving the hospital and, uh, and I get a call on my cell phone. I'm like, Hey, uh, this is Dr. Boy, which is like, you know, uh, did you just leave a CV on my desk, whatever? I'm like, yes. She's like, if you wouldn't be, you know, be true trouble, will you, you know, will you come back to the office? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm going to fly back. So I go back and we have this amazing meeting. Um, I show him the research. I tell him the potential for it. And he calls me up, you know, a month or so later. And he's like, listen, I just got hired as one of the chiefs at Harvard Medical School, uh, Master's General Hospital, Trans Hospital for Children. I want to bring in my first researcher that's going to help with our initiatives and i want it to be you so then obviously i said yes um and that's when i went off to i, I paused after third year medical school to go off to do a year of research at, at harvard at with harvard. Dr. Boyevich, yeah <laughs> so you put <clears throat> med school the academics a little on side you know on the side to follow up with this research project at harvard with the leading surgeon of plastic surgery yeah, one of them definitely. Yeah. It's just an elite program. It's not. A, it wasn't a tough, a really tough choice to make. Was it, it was not. Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah. You know. What did you hope to accomplish? Because there were things that came out of the study and the research that you had done there. Right. So my my intention at that time was to to go into plastics, you know, and, and find a way to integrate some of the stuff that I was learning, holistic stuff, into surgery. And so when I got there, Shriners was such an amazing institution. You know, um, they had all these like toys for the kids, all these rooms and uh, yoga, yoga and child life therapy and nurse practitioners, just an amazing team of care nutritionists. And I looked at this and this whole time I was kind of approaching this kind of holistic approach to, to medicine and consciousness and what are the elements that we really need, you know, nutrition, exercise, meditation, and this understanding of oneness where it's like, what is my purpose to the collective you know, what is my purpose in the collective conscious? How am I expressing myself creatively? How am I connecting with everything around myself? When you say collective conscious, 
What do you mean? So that people can now listen to you talk and understand your references over the next, you know, couple of examples or explanations. What do you mean by collective one consciousness? Well, one is consciousness can be regarded as, as a source, if you will, or, or the force or God or whatever you want to call it is essentially um, the nature of existence. The consciousness itself, you know, is, is something that is indivisible. You know, there's many people that have um, done it through the materials perspective where the brain is you know, the operant device and we are, it's creating consciousness and we are focused operating from the brain. But then there's the other perspective, you know, the more fluid perspective that was perpetuated by Nikola Tesla and, and people like, you know, Deepak Chopra that are trying to communicate to everyone that consciousness is something that permeates everything. And, and our brain and what we are is literally receivers for that. And it moves through us. So essentially this is one is consciousness. We can, we can label it as whatever we want, but essentially we are here to, to realize that we are all one and to experience love and, and this unity. And our own personal contribution to that collective is, in my opinion, and I think I feel like many other people, is, it, is the, the highest form of medicine. And that's the essence of oneness medicine is knowing that you can be doing all the nutrition, all the movement, all the meditation you want. But if you're not doing what you love and, and, and on your purpose and on your path, the universe has a way of getting you back on it in an aggressive or a not so aggressive way. The choice is usually up to us. And how do you apply that then to medicine or children in a burn unit? Good you know, question. And <laughs> Cause it is, you know, like it takes a certain person and a certain mindset to be open to hearing the dialogue that you're saying. Yes. Um, and then another for a patient to understand this in terms of healing themselves or allowing a different healing process. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a collection of a great opportunity and, a, and the perfect facility and you know the work that i was doing and the people that were teaching me this whole time and so i went to dr boy which i'm like listen uh, you know this this antioxidant is awesome and i feel like we can do it whenever we want but i think we have a cool opportunity to create something that's never been created which is an integrative approach to surgery that's a structured approach incorporating nutrition movement meditation purpose creativity connection in a study that's based on the American Burn Association's highest criteria. So it's like intervention. So they're going to be getting like the best food. Um, their sleep is going to be monitored. They're going to be getting like blood tests, urine tests to see all the nutritional biomarkers and how they're operating here. But then there's also a financial element. How much is this costing the hospital? What are the complication rates? How long are these patients staying? Um, is this all causing us to save money? And finally, a psychosocial factor to the study where, okay, are these kids integrating better into the community? What is their quality of life after they leave here? So there's an education element to you. So it's like a camp style intervention where all these principles can be applied and kids that are preparing for these reconstructive surgeries have this structured approach to go through okay before your surgery you get the highest nutrition um, you're reflecting on your purpose so one aspect of the study is this goes back to terry Ehrlich. i don't know if you told you the story but there was an amazing surgeon um, that would ask all his patients what's one thing you want to do after your surgery um, when your surgery goes well and the only thing i want you to do is to send me a picture of you doing that thing Dr. Kurt Tribble and Terry would tell that story and I got super inspired and essentially he would get all these pictures of a guy, you know, fishing with his son, a, a, a girl riding her bike with her dad and having that vision, the vision of something higher than yourself is the highest form of medicine and that caused these patients in addition to great medical care to transcend these insurmountable odds. So an aspect of the study that I added, which is the essence of oneness medicine is what's one thing you want to do, you know, after your surgery goes well, that makes you happy, makes someone else happy. So not only it's the nutrition, the movement, the all that stuff, they're reflecting on this higher purpose as well. Do you find children accommodate better to this? <clears throat> like are, are children more open to this way of thinking than an adult might be as they're, you know, what I would think uh, uncomfortable, in pain, mm. uh, having gone through a terrible life situation to be in the situation in the first place? Right. Um, so due to the care at Shriners, there's a lot of these uh, patients that are here long term. So now they're more stabilized, but they still have to have these major reconstructions multiple times a year. So they're staying at the hospital and, and the hospital has all these resources, but they were, they were not uh, being put in a system. So this is now getting them put in a system. And believe it or not, like children are incredibly 
able to understand these things. So we don't have to make it complicated for them. It can be as simple as, <clears throat> what do you want to do after you get out of here that's going to make you happy? Every kid can answer that question. It's, it's I want to ride my bike with my dad. Great. Every morning after yoga class, you know, in our meditation, we're going to spend two minutes you visualizing riding your bike with your dad. And that intervention being regarded as extremely serious in patient care, because it is. Because that is what causes us to, to think of something higher than ourselves, And that's where some magic that even medicine cannot explain happens. So you go through this study, you do all this work. What's the outcome of it? So we designed, so it took a whole year. So mm -hmm. I was doing many things, like I finished my yoga teacher training at the time. So a lot of the girls that I did my training with, you know, they were, they were signed up to be the yoga teachers. And we had to organize like the laboratory analysis and uh, a team of nutritionists, a team of yoga teachers, a team of movement coaches to teach them more like primal movements and play. Um, team of doctors, nurses. So it took a whole year. My, the entire time that I was there, I was designing the study and we finally got it approved. It, we, it was presented at uh, Harvard's Integrative Medicine Study. It was, um, it was presented at the Surgical Research Conference, very well received. And then um, I had a friend of mine who wanted to take over my research position. So then I, my year was up, the study was now approved finally and, and ready to be done. And I had gone back to school. So now we're still working on implementing um, the study exactly the way we want it. Um, so the, the system is in place. Was it hard to go back to school after that? Like not seeing something um, through fully, you know? You know, I, I didn't feel like I didn't see it through. I felt like this was a, a large project that many people thought that wouldn't happen. You know, when you, were, when you do a study, you say, okay, um, Leanne, we have water and coffee, which giving water to one patient and giving coffee to another patient, well, let's see what happens. This is like, you're giving a full nutritional protocol that's very complex. Food, sleep, sunlight, water, this, um, meditation, yoga. These are all different interventions that are being implemented. So many people are like, listen, kid, you're not gonna get this done. So within a year, we got it done. It's just gonna take longer to get it to fruition. Um, but the most important part of it was that this led me to the realization in designing this study that maybe surgery wasn't for me. Maybe I'm really more passionate about medicine and how it's evolving. And cause I, I had met amazing people through mm -hmm. this. Went to get counsel from Dr. Herbert Benson, uh, met Deepak Chopra, um, went to see Dr. Andrew Weil. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I did want to mention that. What's it like having a mentor like a, and Dr. Andrew Weil, you know, you can Google that name and yeah. it's, a, it's a very familiar face that that pops up. What, what are you looking for? I mean, you've got these mentors that have this very holistic mm -hmm. approach to everything to take it back. Like what does oneness, because oneness medicine is what you have founded. Mm -hmm. What is its purpose? So the purpose of oneness medicine, first of all, it's, it's a perspective. It's a perspective. First of all, understanding that, um, our purpose within the collective conscious and contributing to that purpose is the highest form of medicine. You know, I don't know if you've read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I've heard of it. I haven't read yeah, it. Yeah, it's an amazing book, essentially, like about a, a, psych, a psychotherapist that was in prison in a, a, a concentration camp. And he did analysis of which people made it through that in, insurmountable suffering. And it was people that found meaning in that suffering. And that meaning is a sense is mo the most healing thing. So in medicine, specifically, we look at primary care as family medicine. That's what primary care is essentially. But I feel that the circle still needs to get expanded. That's, that's not the primary level of care. I still think that's on the tertiary level and everything else is even beyond that. Okay, but Nemo, like mm. there's waiting lists to get in to see doctors. You know, we're definitely in a system right now where it's fixed, like it, we're not in preventative medicine right now. Our, me our, our medical system right now is just based on giving meds and trying to fix a problem rather than preventative medicine. You'd be surprised, actually. Um, are we are we starting to see a shift? Because most people I have, and and I tend to have a lot of holistic and naturopathic doctors in here more so than, right. than a, you know that because I truly believe there's a preventative aspect to it. Yeah. So just to finish the, the thing on minus medicine first. So primary care yeah. is, in my opinion, something that the person does themselves to themselves on themselves. That's primary care. So understanding nutrition exercise, meditation, and taking that meditation to moving meditations like yoga, tai chi, qigong, all to the point where a person can get to this aspect of oneness, this self-realization. 
And, uh, and that, that is primary care in my mind. Okay. And I, I love you for this. I, I, sometimes you just want people to eat he- healthy vegetables, some protein and some fruit. I mean, that, that's a struggle for some people right there right. or to get an hour of physical activity a day. So are you, are you speaking to a different, like, who are you speaking to? Because right now you've lost 90, you know, a good percent of the population who just can't eat a well-balanced meal and do physical activity, let alone get into a mindset of, of being able to, to heal. I think it's important to establish a web and a structure, something that people can um, look at and eventually see, okay, that's where I need to go. Whether or not um, you see the whole, you know, you don't, you don't need the, the whole path to take the first step. That's the most important thing. So when we have an outline, you can look at a person and, and with these different tools, see where they're at and then ask them, you know, give them tools and options to take the next step. You're asking me first about a perspective. That's why I want to share. No, the- I find it fascinating Yeah. because I would like to get to that, you know, 10th level that you've just mentioned, right? I just realize in my, in my communication with people, right. some of them are still struggling at the most basic step. 100%. Absolutely. And, and, and that's where the, the practitioner that, that's working with them needs to realize where they're at and, and offer them little tools to get to the next step. Mm-hmm. And everybody's where they need to be. That's the biggest thing to remember. You know, And whether someone's doing this or that or where, where they're at, it, it's very arbitrary. And, and that's an element of, of oneness is, is like one wave comparing itself to another wave. It, it's useless because they're both the same ocean. You know what I'm saying? So whatever a person needs to get to their their next step is what what's best for them. So again, that's that's the one this medicine is understanding that the truest form of medicine is self-realization, understanding that we are the universe in physical form, and what is our purpose and our contribution to that um, specific collective in a way that's self-transcendent and able to help people and make other people's experience here better. So you always see, for example, like some people that are just have the worst health habits. Like you see them in the Balkans all the time. Like they're smoking, eating the worst food, but they're happy. They're connected to people. They're social. And for some reason, they're living till 90. That some, yeah, th- that those, they exist. They, absolutely. they exist. Yes. Point being is like that you see this a lot in the athletic community, right? Like we're obsessing about our nutrition, about our movement, about this. But that stress of that perfection is undermining the very efforts of those intentions. And that's why like... Heart-centered living, community, connection, purpose, creativity, that's the highest form of medicine. And everything else around that is maintenance of the vehicle to be able to perform and do those things and enjoy life. Now we need... I find it amazing that you say for some people who are eating right, doing all the exercise, they're stressing themselves out over doing all of that properly. I'm not speaking this from like a high chair. Like this is me like... Going through all this myself, right, and then realizing this, and I'm like, okay, like this is experiential learning, right. And as yourself as an athlete, like I loved your story when you told it at the event. Mm-hmm. Like I was getting up at five, but it was a mom. I was training. I was busy. After a while, the body My says body. no. It did, yeah. I and the, I listened. I listened to my body, right, and that was the that was the step of me leaving my 20 year career. Is that yeah. that, that's, I, a, I got, that's a great example. Right. It's still difficult and it's not like a mad, there's not a magic answer mm. after it because I still have to take that frightening leap of faith and then I still have to go through a massive transition, right, right. Of, of figuring things out. But I'm fascinated by the med- the medicine side because your journey, because I, I, I want to get to more, your journey is still unraveling because then you finish med school, you have other projects on the go, like yeah. where, okay, because you're not that far out where are you going with this and how are you helping people now yeah we are we are covering a lot definitely i have to i know <laughs> yeah I, mean, uh, I used to think my five minute no, interviews no, on no, the no, show no, were tough yeah so i think it is important to mention like you know the experience with dr andrew wow I, yeah. I think that tell me about that because so i thought that was cool i just left boston we we have done this amazing like inflammatory complications study the integrative surgery trial was on its way and i had realized that i wanted to do family medicine and public health so i was like i need to find people that think more like me or that are more inclined to natural medicine, but are still medicine. So I went to the University of Arizona and Dr. Andrew Wild pioneered the fellowship in integrative medicine there. And, and, and that is the reason why thousands of doctors now in the end are getting trained in integrative medicine. Um, they're learning not, not, not only their medical practices, but um, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, exercise, nutrition, all these things that are not taught in med school, they're teaching now. 
And I went there and I did like a month long immersive experience with them. Uh, Dr. Anne Marie Chiasson was the facilitator of that, who herself is an amazing physician, was studying with shamans as into energy medicine. So I finally had people that were practicing evidence based, but still had these you know, perspectives that were different and also were practitioners themselves. And that looked at me like, wow, like you're not nuts. Because a lot of the times you're, you're in school, you're surrounded by all that kind of stuff. You know, people don't share the same perspectives. Especially when you're in Arizona. Yeah. And you're amongst the rocks and the, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the Sedona, like, it's almost like there's a belief in that area too, right. of the healing powers of, you know, the environment there. Right. And the people that live there are all, you know, I love it. Yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. <laughs> but, it's amazing. but I, I, you know, people were like, did you feel the, did you feel the, the pull, the grab? And I'm like, right. I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so it was great. So I established that with them. And then uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, I really connected and we chatted and I told him about the study. Because what we ultimately want to do is we want to do a documentary about the study and show people like a new approach to surgery. So then he checks in with me once in a while to see, you know, what I'm working on. And I got, I finished up fourth, fourth year after that and uh, finished med school, got my MD and decided that I needed a year to, to, to do my own projects before residency. Cause you can see it, it's been like four years of undergrad, two year masters, school, licensing exams, everything, research. Um, so I felt that I would be best prepared um, if I took a year to, immerse myself more in family medicine, public health, um, see these projects through and we, which we have just done, um, with one of them, we had just presented a, our paper for inflammatory complications of laser surgery in pediatric burns in Las Vegas. Um, and that was an extremely important study. So just finished that up. And I'm also working on oneness medicine and, you know, doing filmmaking and some acting as well. And just having, having fun again, to tell you the truth. I, I, it was interesting because I know that there's the, there's that aspect of my make some stuff, the modeling, and then you yeah. picked up the camera and are doing film work as well. Can you do all of this or do you find that the more you're doing, the better you are as a doctor? I think it was the perfect balance that I, that I needed. And that speaks to the whole doctor sacrificing everything, you know, to get through med school. But for me, like, I take my work very seriously, mm -hmm. but I'm not a serious dude, if you, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so I love to joke around, love to have fun, and I felt like I needed to sacrifice all that in, in order to succeed, and I did. And now, it's like, how can we share these messages, these conversations, in a way that's entertaining and accessible to people? So through Oneness Medicine as well, like, you know, I'm working on a, a mini documentary series that, fo uh, that hosts different healers. And it's a long form interview series where we talk about different aspects of the medicine and we do a reflection and give lessons to people to take away. But it's very like medicine for oriented. Um, so that's a way that filmmaking plays into that. And I think things like acting as well, it, you're able to express yourself creatively, have fun and also have the potential to tell meaningful stories, which then balanced with the clinical work and all that stuff <clears throat> in, a, in a very you know, organized way, you know, has the potential to have a very powerful message. You practice a certain way. You were talking about doing a fasting, like go, if you can, can you, for those of us that aren't needing life-saving surgeries or, you know, God forbid the burn unit, you right. know, cause I know there's a lot of work being done there. What would you say for a general listener <clears throat> right now? You talk about fasting, you were talking about you know, the consciousness, the oneness of being happy of community, where did the, where does that lie? And what are some small things that people can do now to be able to set themselves on a little bit more on the right path? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it kind of led to the approach of wellness medicine when, when I was in Bridgeport and there was a girl, um, she was my neighbor and she had gone through this terrible thing where somebody broke into her house and like raped her at gunpoint and she was on these antidepressants, all this kind of stuff. And I'd met her cause she was made, walking her dog in Bridgeport. She had moved away from Miami to get away from it all. And her and I just started becoming friends. I'd go up on the roof and, you know, take breaks from studying and she'd walk her dog and we'd talk about like nutrition and this, this and that. I was trying to help her get her off her medications, this kind of stuff. And one day she comes to me and she's like, Nemo, I was sitting on the roof the other day and I was writing down like all the things I need in my life. And I wrote nutrition, exercise, meditation, in observation. Oh my God, it spells your name. I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, well, observation is meditation. So I would add an oneness to the O. So she's like, oh my God, it's Nemo. I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. But in retrospectively, when I literally looked at it, like the different things that we need, we do need extra nutrition. So we need 
um, elements for the vehicle. So we need food, we need water, we need sunlight. We need to understand that nutrition is not just food, right? So air, water, sunlight, sleep, food, and environmental aspect, right? What's your environment like? How's your house set up? Do you have like uh, geopathic stress under your house? Like, is it vibrating? Like, is it offsetting your living space? That's nutrition. Exercise, understanding that, you know, the, beyond the aesthetic elements, the, the body is, is meant for movement. You're a gymnast, you know, this better than everybody. Um, is that the body is meant for movement and, and, and enjoyment. Like we're not just meant to like polish our car in the driveway or to optimize its range of motion and what can it do? Like we're meant to enjoy it. So it's shifting the perspective from even exercise to movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the third element, meditation. So first starting off with the body through things like yoga, running, rhythmic things that eventually gets our mind to slow down. Because to tell somebody, like, you're absolutely right, go do a 10-day meditation retreat. No, you wouldn't start like that. No. I started with a three-minute Headspace app. Right. Got to five. I think I went to 10. Uh, but found that I actually wanted to, to find the time to do it. Right. That I found, like, I was starting to sleep a little bit better. I could shut my head off, you know, all the checklists in my head a little bit better. Yeah. And so I think once you start to feel an effect from it, there's a desire to continue to do it. It's just people give up before they feel the effect. Like, it's no different than training, right? Like, all your all your life, you've... Like gymnasts, probably, like, are the most well-rounded athletes there are. And how long did it take you to develop that intelligence in your body? Mm -hmm. Why should training the mind be any different? Right? And that goes back to the epidemic of <clears throat> ADHD and, and, and some of these psychiatric diagnoses, which are largely subjective. They're looked at... Why do you say that? Because it's the truth. It's it's people we're, we're looking at these things as, as solidified entities, mm -hmm. you know, versus fluid processes. We've we've taken the mind into particular patterns, into patterns of unfocused living, social media, this, that, whatever, and then that gets to a point where the pattern becomes difficult to control, and then that's labeled as a condition. Oh, you have this, or you have that. But those diagnoses are largely based on you know seven people getting in together in a room and be like, oh, if people meet six out of these 10 criteria, blah, 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 label them as this. And that's, it, it, we have to find a, a specific way to structure that, which is linked to obviously prescribing medications. If you look at the process as a fluid process, like over time, this is what I've done that has led to this particular stuff. There is no reason why through different practices like meditation, which now there's plenty of evidence on, rewires the brain, you get back into balance. So if the mind has been going this way through these practices, you rewire the brain again and get back into balance. Because you've done a lot of work with children. Like as I'm hearing, a lot of your residencies have been with children's units. Yeah. <laughs> so could do you think when you, especially when you're looking at ADHD right. and, and some of those issues, that the work could start then with those kids to be like, what got them here in the first place and trying to rewire it with children? Or do you see that more for an adult? No, I see it for everybody. And I think... You know, Dr. Walsh has an amazing book, um, Mind Over Meds, where he kind of discusses what is happening in the epidemic of over prescribing of medications. You know, just looking at the child objectively, like what are our habits? Like what are we allowing the child to do? Um, why is a high energy child that just wants to be outside being labeled as pathological? You know, and obviously there are extremes to this, mm -hmm. right? But the general population you know, we are over prescribing medication for things that can be addressed through behavioral health interventions. Where do you, where else do you see that we're over prescribing? Hmm. Everywhere, honestly. But I'd say that, that, that psychiatry is a hundred percent, you know, the greatest culprit of this. Then pain medications, the, you know, chronic pain management is a, is a huge issue with opioid addiction now. Okay. Where do you see from your out view of treatment? Do you see pain inflammation how do you see that how without it being on medicine and prescriptions how like, do you see it changing like what we just mentioned nutrition movement meditation doing what you love doing your purpose contributing to something higher than yourself expressing yourself creatively. it all still comes back to it and no matter what no i matter throw, what no is. matter what i throw out throw at you that's what it's going to come back to. and that's what i was talking about initially the funnel right mm -hmm. so we have the the, the out, outward the quaternary level we'll call it surgery major interventions then we have like the 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 tertiary level um primary care medicine physicians medications then we have like the secondary level okay natural herbs nutritionists blah blah that are teaching you these natural methods but it's still not you 
it's still a physiotherapist, a nutritionist, that this is that. The primary level of care is you doing things for you, taking care of you, to realize that you are beyond yourself. You are the universe. You are oneness. You're here to contribute to the clock of consciousness as, as a being of, of energy. And that to me, like that... So we have integrative medicine that integrates everything, which is amazing, which has been a crazy movement. But okay, now, yeah. How do you see, because you've, you've referred to integrative medicine a couple right. of times. What's for you is that definition? What constitutes integrative medicine over something else? Well, that's what Dr. Andrew Weil and his colleagues have pioneered, you know, in, in the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, specifically is integrating contemporary Western medicine with all other applicable healing modalities that have been known traditionally throughout the world in a way that's evidence-based and implemented in a, in, by a healthcare professional. And even Dr. Weil himself is saying, you know, integrative is a transient word. Eventually, it's just gonna be good medicine. So when I say oneness medicine, I would say that it's integration with intention. Because we're not just integrating, we are here to integrate, but also self-realize and realize like truly what we are and that we are energy movers of energy and living in a world that's, that's one. Do you still play basketball? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, like, I'm like, where does your oneness, where does your movement, where does, yeah. do you still, is it soothing for you? Is it almost like a stress release when you go and hit the basketball court? Well, yes, actually, um, interestingly enough, I, I got, I feel I got through medical school because of basketball. Mm -hmm. So I approach medical school as a basketball player. You know, now I approach basketball as a doctor. Now I realized how much I really didn't work smart as a basketball player. And now that I had to evolve in medicine, when I'm on basketball courts, I'm, I'm surgical now. One, there's two things that's happening. I'm not so stressed out anymore because listen, like I've seen the worst of things, kids disfigure this. I don't care about missing a shot, which ironically makes me way better because I'm more relaxed. And I, look, I approach the game strategically. You know, I think, I think more and it's been a lot more fun to play. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm probably the best I've ever been, or I feel. It's too bad you're not still, it, it, right? In retrospect, if you only could be this talented on the court physically with the mindset and the training that you have now. You never say never. Are you still there, thinking of playing? There are some options on the table. Let's so just, like let's, Serbian national let's team just say point? that. Let's just say that. There's, there's been <laughs> you've, some, run out of, you've, you've run out of uh, el eligibility, I would think, at, at university. No, no, I'm talking about professional. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh my but. gosh. Or you should just make a movie of you playing an actor of a basketball player who goes and makes. See, we can combine it? it all together. Yeah, that's 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 ultimately been the goal, and you know, even through film and stuff, is it's just been a lot of fun. And I think that's a really important point I want people to to take away with. If you're not doing what you love, you can be the healthiest, quote unquote, on paper. But truly, that that is the highest form of medicine. And when I work through people through oneness medicine, um, that's just what I take them through. Like, that's what I love doing, especially now before residency. I can spend time with people. I can take them through these interventions, offer them this stuff in a way that's, you know, accessible. Where are you going to be doing? Where are you going to be working now? So it is um, oneness medicine. Literally, is a is an online platform. I will be in in Canada and Ottawa, between Ottawa and Toronto, and very likely in California. Um, doing more family medicine related stuff and research. But one oneness medicine is an online platform that's getting developed right now. People can work with me one on one. I do like corporate wellness stuff, group immersions. We have that mixed medical arts podcast um, and a community of affiliate, of affiliate practitioners that people can reach out to and, and see that everybody has different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say, where can people find you? Uh, best way to find me right now is on Instagram. Uh, just oneness Nemo, send me a message. Uh, you, they can email me at welcome at onenessmedicine.com um, for any kind of thing, whether it's personal work group, group uh, events, mm -hmm. any kind of stuff like that. Well, it's been amazing to see the work that you've done, and I can't wait to see what kind of happens next in your career. But I think the mindset and, and the understanding of where you're coming from, I think, is really quite fascinating. So it was great to get reconnected. I hope people kind of can take something from this. And, you know, there was a number of different levels and steps and, and, and kind of like branches. Right. Right. I found like, okay, here's the tree. Here's a couple of branches. Choose one. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're awesome. And thank but, you so yeah, much for having me. It was me. a lot. Thanks so much. And congratulations. It was really neat. And it's so funny because I, you know, once I always do like the, the, 
the Google stalking of people prior to this. And like, I, you had like this long hair. You had like long hair. I did, I did. I was I like, did. oh my God, that's who it was for sure. But I really appreciate it. Oneness um, Medicine, if you're looking, and Oneness Nemo, I think, right, was uh, the uh, Instagram handle. Right. And of course, people will be able to find uh, more information if you head to my notes for uh, the Living Your Life podcast. But I just want to say that is a wrap. Please continue to like, subscribe, share, let people know that this podcast is out there with some really fascinating, great guests. And hopefully you're able to take uh, something from all of this. I got to go. I got to go up my meditation. (laughs) I got to find that. I got to find that balance. I'm really looking forward to the day where I feel it. Like I'm like, this is what people are talking about. Have a great day, everyone. That's Living Your Life with Leanne Lang.